The Bible Treasury. A monthly magazine of papers on scriptural subjects. Volume 19, Article 1, Part 19 of 93, 1892, and 1893. The Early Chapters of Genesis. By William Kelly. Genesis 2 verses 21 to 23. The singular formation of woman is another detail reserved by the Holy Spirit for the section of Jehovah Elohim. Nor could it be appropriately elsewhere, supposing one inspired writer to have indicted the preceding section as well as this. In the general account of creation, Elohim made man in his image after his likeness, with dominion over all that peopled sea and sky, the earth, and all that crept upon it. Or, as it is summed up, Elohim made man in his image, in the image of Elohim created he him, male and female created he them. Impossible to conceive a more distinctive and express place assigned to the race from its beginning, with marked preeminence over all those creatures here below, as God's viceroy and their head on earth. Yet, whatever its exclusion of the evolutionary fable and the more evidently inspired because it is by anticipation in the simple statement of the truth, special relationships are untouched. Creature nature and position are alone laid down with perfect precision and in language as noble as all was very good even in the Creator's estimate. From Genesis 2 verse 4 on the other hand we receive an equally fine and suitable development of man's moral constitution and the special scene of his probation in the Garden of Eden with its mysterious trees, and his relations, not only to God on the tenure of obedience, but to the subject creatures as their appointed Lord, peculiarly also and with the nicest care to woman as counterpart. Hence here only do we hear of man formed by Jehovah Elohim, dust of the ground, yet the breath of life by him and breathed only into his nostrils, so that he alone thus became a living soul. How admirably each in place, Elohim's image in chapter 1, constituted a living soul by Elohim's direct and breathing in chapter 2, yet outwardly dust, his offspring thus as no other on earth was. The perfectness of the revelation is clear from the impossibility of displacing a single particular of either account, which is at once intelligible if the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to write both, whereas it would only add to the magnitude of the miracle, where all miracle is denied, if we imagine two uninspired men writing two accounts going over the same ground in part at least, neither inconsistent in any respect yet without repetition, each true to an evident and most important design, and together issuing in a complete result, necessary to give the believer intelligence in the truth of creation and in the moral mind of God so far as it was then revealed. The material differences, as well as those of form, flow from the design of each and are the more strikingly instructive as indicted by the same writer. To assume that they preclude their being the work of the same hand is ignorance of scripture and of the power of God. That creation should be revealed in a style unornate, measured, precise, with its recurring forms of expression, exactly suits a subject matter so majestic. That the revelation of the moral place of man, in relation to all above him and beneath him and in the nearest association with him, should be couched in special terms freer and more varied, with a fullness and picturesqueness of detail out of keeping with the generality of creation pure and simple, is just what was requisite. What more worthy of creation than he spake, and it was done, he commanded, and it stood fast. And so it is in Genesis 1 to 2 verse 3. But from 2 verse 4 et sequentia, how proper and affecting the change to Jehovah Elohim fashioning man, and subsequently in breathing the breath of life, planting a garden in Eden for him, and placing, taking, setting him there with its two trees, suited to that scene and time and object, and no other, and with a described environment as full of interest as expressive of goodness on his part, then again bringing the inferior animals to their rightful lord, and, as the suited crown, bringing the woman whom he had builded from one of his ribs to fill that place of help meet, the lack of which all other creatures only made more apparent. To call this a duplicate of the account of creation is the dregs of skeptical criticism, higher criticism only in the eyes of men divinely ignorant and unsteadfast, who rest these as also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. No doubt a different hand might account for separate accounts with varied phraseology and style, and distinct objects in each, and this regularly reappearing throughout. 
but the beauty, truth, and power of inspiration are only maintained by the unbreathed power of God, which enabled the same writer to vary his style and representation, in accordance with the varying design of the narrative, marked by the divine name employed as each part required with all its suited concomitants. We may see in every instance that the unbelieving hypothesis miserably fails to explain the phenomena, or the facts, which to the believer make manifest the divine energy that inspired Moses as every other writer of scripture. It is a libel to impute inconsistencies and contradictions. None but an enemy so says or thinks. To call a wholly distinct aspect bringing forward different objects, an inconsistency, yet more a contradiction is not criticism, but ill will. How absurd in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire to set Chapter 2 on its union and external prosperity American Samoa a contradiction of Chapter 1 on its extent and military forces. Yet this is a merely human view, immeasurably short of the comprehensiveness, and depth, the far-reaching wisdom and prophetic scope, of the Divine Word. In the verses before us is another example falling under the same principles. And Jehovah Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up flesh in its stead. And the rib which Jehovah Elohim had taken from the man he built into a woman and brought her unto the man. And the man said, This time it is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, this shall be called woman Isha because out of man Ish was taken this, verses 21 to 23. Apples of gold truly in baskets of silver. The God who wrought has communicated the truth worthily to us. He would give man the boon of companionship, the joy of fellowship, the interchange of affection, and as the end was good, so the way. For he threw the man into an ecstasy, as the LXX. Septuagint, render it, that he might not feel painfully, yet know perfectly what God was giving him. It was not a separate human being independent of Adam, nor yet a female half severed from the male half of a Janus-like creature as Rabin's fancy. It was not from the head nor from the feet, an absolute equal nor an utter inferior, but from his side, as has been remarked by others of old, the object of nearest love and sustaining care, and associated yet dependent sharer of all joy and sorrow. As Jehovah Elohim deigned to build his rib into an Isha, woman, so he brought her to the man, the highest and best form of marriage, a source never absent from faith at any time, but as it was then, how admirably suited to primeval simplicity in the innocence of both. He who knew all had said that it was not good for the man to be alone. The recognition of Adam's authority in giving a name to the inferior creation only made the gap more sensible. And now that the woman was received as it were from the divine hand, not from Elohim only but from him who in all his action here recorded was laying perfectly the ground for mutual duty in the relationship of marriage, the man said, This time it is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, this shall be called Isha, for out of Ish was taken this. He was instantly conscious of the intimate and suited relationship, though hitherto unacquainted with the divine purpose, and he gave her a name admirably expressive of the fact. How poor are all the imaginations of man on this theme in presence of the truth thus revealed to us? But it could be appropriately communicated, not under the head of creation simply, Elohim, but of its moral government, Jehovah Elohim. So simple, sure, and unforced is the usage of the divine designations here employed, without the crude, superficial, and skeptical hypothesis of distinct writers, destructive as it is of all real intelligence, and of that good and profoundly wise design for God's glory which is the surest mark of inspiration from first to last. Attention may also be drawn to the refutation which the simple facts here revealed give to the vain hypothesis that the use of intelligible speech was a human invention. We need not quarrel in the least with the science of language, any more than with other science. The ablest of comparative philologists cannot rise above the root words in the Aryan, Semitic, and Turanian families of speech, pointing to a common source, the darkness of which science utterly fails to penetrate. Nor need it be doubted that imitative sounds and interjectional cries have added to the force and variety of language since early days. It is only when speculators cry up their little contributions, as if they were an adequate account of the origin of language, 
that they expose themselves to the derision of the Bao Lao and the Pu Pu theories. For those who believe the word of God the question does not exist. It is certain that Elohim blessed our first parents, and said to them, Be fruitful, etc. It is certain that, when moral relations were established, Jehovah Elohim brought the subject creatures to Adam as to their Lord for the names he would give them. Even before this the man had received the injunction imposed on his tenure of the garden with the solemn sanction of death on disobedience, as after naming the animals Adam intelligently expresses the woman's nature and relation to himself in a way beyond all rabbins on the one hand and all philosophers on the other throughout the ages, giving her and himself names accordingly. To deny the reality of all this is worthy of the irrationalism of the rationalist. It is untrue that God addressed the sea monsters and their congeners, though he blessed them. It is the revealed fact that he did from the first address man. He puts honor on his word throughout, but he commanded in chapter 1 as Jehovah Elohim, and was thoroughly understood. So Adam is declared to have exercised speech according to that power of God, alone suited to the beginning, which formed him a grown man in mind as well as in body, and with language as set over the animal kingdom, and with woman the meat companion of his life, where imitative lessons or interjectional outbursts could have no place, any more than root words. This is the truth, and reason is hound to admit that it is as worthy of God as suited to man, even the vain Rousseau, after all, sorts of efforts to account for it, was convecu de l'impossibilita copyright e, presque de copyright mantra copyright e, que les longues a int pu natra, ets a copyright tabler, par de moyens purement humains. Ina copyright gal de homes. That Adam at once named the animals brought to him, that he learned to speak from their cries is an infidel reverie, not an honest exegesis. Science even in its lowest yet haughtiest form, the positive philosophy of Kant, abandons all inquiry into the beginning of things as hopeless, abjures causes, and heeds nothing but the laws of phenomena. Rational science undertakes to treat of no more than the established course of nature, but absolute silence about the beginning. It can give no light on the ultimate producing cause, yet a beginning, a primordial and permanent producing cause, there must have been, and this, whatever the mode or means employed, was none other than God. To unfold creation is not the function of science, which, therefore, if alone, leaves man, infidel. But scripture supplies what science stops short of speaks with divine authority and admirable clearness to the open ear and makes the truth a matter of testimony, not reasoning, and hence adapted to all who believe. This was the way and the pleasure of God if it is not to the taste of men apt to boast of a little science or learning. As the Hindu could not go beyond his imaginary tortoise, neither can the boldest modern speculator beyond the blank wall which bounds his array of secondary causes. Yet to assume that there is nothing, and no one, behind the blank wall, is evidently on man's own ground illogical, for he is wholly ignorant. God who created all knows all, and has revealed what no science can teach, what is of all moment for man to learn, not creation only, but redemption in Christ the Lord. But all have not faith, and faith alone receives what God alone wrought and revealed, momentous to understand on his authority in order to be saved from the lie of the enemy.